Hello and welcome back to another episode of the BDB podcast. Again, we're back on video. I'm super pumped to be here with one of my really good friends. He's actually going to be at BDBlive.com with us. If you haven't got your ticket for BDB Live yet, you're going to want to go over there and grab your ticket to see this guy perform. This is going to be one of our first performances. But on top of having a performance, being inside the brotherhood, living the three-dimensional lifestyle of prospering in health, wealth, and relationships has been something that he's been living by and has done that inside of his own life. He's not just someone who has a talent in like performing or artistry or something like that, but he's also gone out there and crushed in business. The guest that I have today actually was sleeping in his car not that long ago and in 18 months was able to go out there and do over $5 million in sales. This month we'll do over $500,000 in sales and is running a team of 40. You're gonna to wanna to listen to the very end of this episode and catch us at BDB Live. Welcome, Nicholas Elliott. Nicholas, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, man, Pleasure we have two Nicholases on the show. Is this the first time of having two Nicholases on the show? No, we've had Nicholas. Oh, Nicholas, we've had other Nicholas, but. Well, I'm, bet, I'm the better looking one, so. And the more talented. I mean, this guy's decked out right now. If you guys aren't watching the video version, you should go check it out. This guy's got the Gucci belt on. It's looking good. So, and I appreciate you having the spot uh, for yeah. people, again, that aren't watching the video. We're in this awesome loft. And we were just talking about right before this that, you know, when I met you, you were selling for a different company. Yep. And I ran into you. I was, I was consulting the owner of that company that day. And I remember we shook hands. And you were like, man, can you imagine like thinking that we're in a loft in downtown, you just signed your four books that you just released to me. Yeah. You're breaking over $500,000 in a month. You're living a life that's truly consistent and like, powerful and doing what you love to do. Could we imagine that just how long ago is that? Like two years ago, two and a half years ago? It's about that. Isn't yeah. that crazy? It's crazy. Well, for the people that are listening that don't know exactly who Nicholas is, I want to take them through a story like I was telling you that most people think that they can't do it. That they think right. like, oh, you're talented. Like you got Tina and Jim that you talk to all the time on the phone. Yeah, yeah. You've, gone, you've gone through your scripts. You put in the repetitions. How are they going to be able to put in that much time and effort and like build the skill sets that you did? So let's go back a little bit to how you grew up. Yeah. And how you acquired these skills that you now have. Yeah. You know, um, one of my my mottos has always been pain into purpose. You know, I was um, I was sexually abused at a young age, about four, by my mom, and emotionally, mentally battered by her. You know, she was a, a third shift nurse and you know, when mommy got home, you never know what side of her you would get. My dad worked 80 hours a week. He wasn't ever home. Uh, he had a rare uh, disease called osteochondritis dissecans. Uh, basically what that is, Nick, it's where you lack blood flow and oxygen supply in certain areas of the, the body. And for him, it was his knees and it was bone on bone. And I was, you know, I was thinking about this today and I was like, man, you know, my childhood, it was like growing up in a war zone and I never truly felt welcome at home and I never felt welcome outside because at, at school I was getting bullied by kids on the sports teams and stuff like that. So, you know, through my childhood, it was just, it was a, it was a, 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 a compounding uh, snowball of, of pain. I had a lot of pain and and fast forward later, you know, I kind of stumbled upon into sales and, you know, lacking, lacking feeling like I was enough, lacking feel, feeling like I was worthy, um, lacking like, you know, I felt like I couldn't do anything. I was too stupid. That's why I relate to the Rudy, the Rudy story is because, you know, everybody told him he was enough. He wasn't enough. He couldn't do it. He was too dumb. You, you're not meant for it. And I stumbled upon sales and, and you know, I was good at it. And I was, and I was, and, I, and it was, it was, it was easy for for me, and I caught it, and it was something that I didn't care what other people thought because I knew that I could do. I saw the vision, I had the vision. I said, "Yeah, I could be the best at this," and um, you know, that's that's like the the foundation of my my Around past. What time did you find sales? Like, what year was that? How long ago was that? Because obviously, there's still been a journey to get to where you're at. You yeah. Know, even when you found that, you said, "I could be great at this." It doesn't mean that you went out there and lived your dream life, right? So how right. long goes that? Yeah, I started uh, quote unquote doing sales when I was about 16 or 17. I actually started with a company called iForce Nutrition and I was a forum rep and I would get $150 in wholesale product per month to go on the forums, which at the time was bodybuilding.com bodybuilding and Anabolic Minds. They didn't have paid ads and Facebook and all that stuff and I would just answer people's questions and send them to the URLs to order the product and I was really, really good at it. So I've, I've been doing sales now in one way or another for about 12 years, 13 years. 
So when you talk, talk about your story of home and like having a mom, it seemed like a lot of people have a, a home where the dad is like super intimidating and dominant. It kind of sounds like in this home, it was your mom. It was opposite. And for you, like, what did that like look and feel like? Like, how was your conversations with her now? Like, have you guys talked about this? Yeah. Like, obviously, you're talking about it publicly in front of tens of thousands of people, right? Yeah, now, so. absolutely. Yeah, my mom. We we healed. We've we've worked through a lot of things. You know, it's funny. The other day, she sent me a text where it had a a, 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 a photo, and it it was a, a parent with the child, and it said that when you tell your child that there's something wrong with them, it instills shame. And it motivates you to punish them. But when you identify that your child is going through something, it empowers you to support them. And my mom, underneath that photo, said, I wish I knew this when you were a child. And I, you know, I said to her, I said, hey, Ma, you, you, you knew what you knew. I love you. Isn't that an interesting thing, though, right now? It's like I see this more than ever. The quickening of education and looking back just five years ago, I wish we knew. And now for families, this is like happening over and over again. We're able to look back and go, I can't believe my mom did this. Yeah. I can't believe my dad did this. I can't believe we didn't know this. And there's almost this feeling of like, why didn't they go figure out this information? Like they say, I wish I would have known this. And deep down, I'm almost like, you could have found that. Yeah. Like you could have known that you were doing something wrong. You know what I mean? What do you think's changed now that's like quickening our education? Like what's changed? I think just a conscious culture, you know? Um, my mom is not on Facebook all day. My dad's not on Facebook all day. They're not getting targeted with ads on, hey, are you experiencing this? I used to do the same thing. I used to be this and now I'm doing this. My, my transformation and starting point was this. Does that yeah. sound familiar? Opt-in, right? <laughs> my parents weren't opting into anything. Yeah. They knew what they knew, you know? And, um, you know, it's funny because I, I I'm so thankful for everything that I went through because the foundation, the infrastructure, the behavioral imbalances and, 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 and flaws that I experienced as a child with my mom is the same practical things that I teach my salespeople, right? Uh, with Tina, <laughs> you know, my mom was Tina. So I'm basically training my team to help save thousands of versions of my mom, which has been uh, a real blessing and an honor to do. Yeah, man. And the, throughout your process of going into sales and going into business, like I always say that at, in BDB, in the three-dimensional business, man, someone asked me, out of health, wealth, and relationships, what's the first area that you focus on? And I'm like, really, when it came down to it, I go, oh, I focus on them, actually, before I focus on health, wealth, or relationships. Mm -hmm. Like It was so weird to me to think about, like, wow, I actually don't focus on those areas. Like I focus on the person that shows up in those areas. And so for you, like you are talented at sales, yes. yet the hardest thing for any man to get over is themselves and like right. the past experiences that we have, the perceptions that we have and lenses that we look through at life, it, it really uh, hinders how we learn. We could read a book and miss everything yes. that it's trying to teach us because yes. of our lens. We could listen to a speaker, we could have a friend, like we're only picking up things that align with what we already believe and those are the hardest things to break. So yeah. for you, like, Walk me through you being talented, which everyone I believe out there has a capacity to become great at something. Absolutely, 100%. And how did you break through those things or how did those things hold you back as a person? Those like things that had nothing to do with you. Like yeah. if you would have got better at sales, it would have not made you more successful at yeah. your sales position. 100%. Because you were holding yourself back. 100%. So tell me about that. Yeah, absolutely. My, my turning point for sure was when I started taking a class called Life Skills. My buddy, uh, Joe Brandy, who's the CEO, uh, the uni for orphans and he's like man you need to go check out life skills because at the time I had an ego I was snappy short fuse sabotaging myself emotionally unstable and I was like dude I don't need this what are you talking about if someone's identifying with those things like explain them a little bit more in depth yeah What's just symptom yeah just uh, uh, you know I would go through bouts of depression uh, severe anxiety um, at the time, I didn't know that my narrative inside my mind was very toxic, and I hated myself. It was it was difficult to look at myself in the mirror. And the the big uh, the big discovery that I found in life school skills was, you know, uh, the age of directives. This was a huge, huge uh, uh, wealth of new knowledge for me. That from the ages of zero to eleven, that the subconscious mind that's where the the dominant programming is going to happen. Right, and what that means is, is later in your teenage years, your adulthood years, uh, there may be an event or an experience that happens, and your subconscious mind can't tell the difference between a childhood wound and reality. 
And I went through this, this journey of being conscious and outside of myself and looking down at myself and looking at my behaviors and the emotions that I was experiencing that trigger those behaviors and going back into my past and finding out when did I feel that way when I was a child. And I did that for almost three years and it was super painful, but it's kind of like peeling an onion, you know? What would trigger me and took weeks to get over, sometimes months, now takes five seconds, right? Because I'm able to catch it and be like, hey, you know what? My mind's telling me one thing, but it's not the truth. This is the truth. I am valuable. I am enough. I'm not a loser. I'm not gonna mess it up. Let's go. That's so interesting. Like you're saying that when people are experiencing something right now, generally they can link it back to a first occurrence. Something that they, they had experienced that feeling before. Yep. It's almost a way of discovery. Like you're almost feeling it now in a way to discover something that has happened in the past Absolutely. that's hindering you. Uh, that's so interesting that you say that. My, my mother used to shut the door on my face and say, Nicholas, I don't want to hear it. I, I can hear her voice right now doing it. It gives me just like the shakes. And one time I was running the Golden Gate Half Marathon with uh, an ex-girlfriend and I wanted to play a song for her. And she said, I, I don't want to hear it. I triggered felt the adrenaline, felt the warmth of my skin, felt the, the, the rush of my heart. And that was, a, that was another milestone for me, that occurrence, because I realized, because I was going through life skills at the time, I realized, wow, like my, my mind literally right now is responding to this, or excuse me, reacting to this like a child, like a five-year-old. Because I was, and, and how Ron, my mentor at the time, explains it is when you, when you have an inflicted childhood wound uh, at a young age, that you actually stop maturing in that area. Yeah. That's insane. I've they never call it arrested that. development. Wow. Yeah. And this is where you see people like, they snap all of a sudden. I remember the, even growing up, like my dad, had, me and him have like gotten so much more close. Like we're working on a job in his business right now together, which is oh, cool. cool. Yeah, it's been awesome. But at the time, there was times where my dad would just snap on, in a moment on yeah. any type of thought. Like I would say one random thing and it would send him into a trigger until you left. Yeah. Like if you were still in the room with him, he wouldn't stop yelling at you until he got to go away, defuse, and then he would like come back and always apologize. Yeah. But at this point I was like, dude, like why do you keep doing this? I didn't know what the heck was the problem though. And those were definitely things that sent me into like different feelings of fear. Yeah. One of the things that I noticed as well is like, if you want to know if you're insecure, I've noticed I've done this. Yeah. If I notice sometimes when I'm at the gym or something, because I go to a really fit gym, so everyone's like way shredded, like everyone looks great. And what I found is that if a bunch of people start laughing and you don't know why they're laughing, you start thinking about are they laughing at you? And then you start thinking about why they would be laughing at you. Yeah. And like that, that to me has been a way for me to find insecurities in myself, right. where I'm like, it's just a thought, right? It's like, yeah. it, whoa, am I like, do, it, do I look bad right now? Like, oh, like, are they laughing at the weight that I'm picking up? Like, yeah. just random thoughts like that. Yeah. And for anyone listening right now, like, think about that for yourself. Have people, la go into random places where people are laughing at nothing and realize like the insecurities that pop up inside of you mm -hmm. and you're like, are they laughing at me? Are they laughing where I'm sitting? Am I in the wrong line? Like all this fear of like what other people are thinking of you. I don't know if you've ever experienced that before, like random oh, yeah. people laughing yeah. and you're like, you're like, are they laughing at me? It's just like, not my shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something going on. So, yeah. how did the, those things? Like, I think the biggest thing for me and some of the other men out there is ROI. Like, we'll do things that we know why to do them. So we think to get better at sales, to make more money, to have a better relationship. We need to go out there and learn more skills and tactics in that area to improve. Yet, for you, you went into this like life skills. And you went back in your past and you yeah. uprooted these different thoughts and mindsets. And of course you still have to get better at what you do. Like you have to like go out there and put in the work. But what did this do for you professionally? What difference did you have in your inner world, like true prosperity? What change or ROI did this give you? I explain it to Tina on the phone that it's sort of like climbing a mountain and you have a ton of strings behind you. And, you're, and they're pulling you down. And you may be able to get up the mountain, but it's gonna take a heck of a long time. And the healing process is taking scissors and, and cutting those, those strings so that you can accelerate and go faster. So abs uh, speed, uh, peace of mind. Um, and also, too, uh, a shift in focus on, on where I found, find myself worth 
from, you know? Because there was a phase through life skills and through sales where I put my worth in my results. You know, I had a, one of my mentors ask me, Nick, where do you, where do you find your self-worth? And, and for me, you know, I find my self-worth in, it's actually not business, like going down to the orphanage, right? Um, running, meditating, and the more repetitions I do there, the, the better I feel about myself. I don't know, does that kind of answer your question? Well, I think it's cool that, first off, those are all controllable things. Yeah. There's other things in life that aren't that controllable. Right. And so those are all things that you can do. Right. And like no one can really take away, which I think is awesome. Yeah. But also like I wanted to dig deeper in the fact that for me, like if you were to still look through those wounds and be working with Lady Boss, one of the fastest growing companies, running a 40 person team, could you even do it? No, absolutely not. You and know, one, I mean, one of the, like, one of the, most people think though that they just they they need to don't not work on that stuff, and they need to go to work on all go. this other stuff. You have to let it go. I can't tell you how many times Brandon and I have had a conversation where he's like, Nick, you ready for a growing conversation? And I'm like, Oh, yeah, dude, just hit me. Let's do it. You know, and and one of the biggest turning points I had professionally with Brandon was when I I did get triggered with him. You know, because we work so closely together, we're high performers, we want to be the best, we go, 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 and then sometimes we butt heads. And I'm like, Brandon, you're, you're triggering me right now. And he's like, hey, Nick, you ready for a growing conversation? And I'm like, absolutely. He's like, you don't have the luxury to be uh, triggered by, by anything anymore. You don't have the luxury. Cause he's like, because if you want to reach that next level, then you, petty small things like this, they cannot bug you. And if they, if they do, you will not last. So tell me about and tell the other people out there, where did Tina and Jim come from? It's Tina and Jim, right? Tina and Jim. Yeah. Well, let me What's, tell you about who's Tina, Tina and Jim. Jim. So Tina and Jim are the alias uh, ideal client when selling fitness or any, any product. Yeah. So for me, if I was talking to a guy, it'd be Jim. It'd be Jim. Yeah. Jim Smith. Jim Smith. Or if it's a female, it's Tina. What's her last name? Yeah, it's Tina. Just, <laughs> and so... T tell me like how did you develop this because this is something that you like always jump into and I think a lot of people don't put the repetitions into like role play and get better at selling. I, I truly believe for everyone listening that sales is everything. It's everything. It, it's everything like I get my family together through sales. If my dad doesn't want to hang out with me, it's my fault because I didn't sell him. My mom doesn't want to hang out with me, it's my fault because I didn't sell him. Yeah. If, I, if my family doesn't want to hang out with me, it's my fault I didn't sell them. If someone doesn't go to the restaurant you don't want to go to, it's your fault you didn't sell them. And I found that in life, it's all about building value. It's all about shifting perce perception. Right. And you can sell, like, like I said, that's why I'm saying family stuff, because it's not just about money. Sales is selling yourself to go to the gym. Yep. Selling, you know, everything is in sales. And I think at the end of the day, sales is getting people to take action on something they would have never taken action on that's more beneficial Absolutely. for them than what they're doing right now. Absolutely. I've never actually said that before, but hopefully that sounded really good. Yeah. So for you, like, what made you come up with Teen and Jim? Well, how beneficial can it be to everyone listening right now? Yeah, I mean, I think deeper than that, it's just like what I teach, you know? Uh, my belief system is, is very similar to Jordan Belfort's. I believe that every sale is the same. I approach every single sale the same, and I teach a straight line. There's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end. And when I teach my salespeople, Tina, Jim, whatever, if, if they end up on the phone call with you, they've made three decisions. Number one, there's something about themselves that they do not like. Number two, they decided that now is the time to fix it. And number three, that they trust you to be the people to potentially fix it, right? That's a, that's a foundational truth. And I'd also teach six sales points. So there's a foundational truth, right? Because what that allows you to do, that allows you to emotionally detach from the phone call, right? So if someone's running a, a funnel or an application or a high ticket, that person put in an application, you gotta understand that those are the three truths, that there's something that they do not like, they decide now's the time to fix it, and they trust you to be, to potentially be the people that do it, right? So however they show up, right? Because people are gonna put up their walls because they know it's a sales conversation. Oh, I just wanted more information. I just wanted to check it out. You know, I just wanna see what the price is. Inside my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, okay, dude. You, you, you made the three decisions, right? So I don't get attached to that. I literally ignore it, right? And then they get on the straight line. And the straight line that I teach, and this is applicable to any sales process, right, is six sales points. There's six sales points, right? 
five and then six. Six is the close. The reason we fight for six is because the close, two things happen. We get paid and that person goes from sad Tina or sad Jim to happy Jim or happy Tina. Do you want to go through the, the yeah, six? Yeah, I want to go through the six. Okay, we'll go through the six, right? And the cool thing is, and this is, this is what I teach my salespeople, and this is why we convert upwards of 80% on some of our, our products. You know, I have people coming in closing 100% is because a lot of people, they'll focus on six and they won't focus on sales point one, two, three, four, five, right? You hear all the time, what do you say when they say they need to think about? What do you say when they need to, they can't afford it? What do you say when they need to talk to their husband? It's like, well, dude, let's talk about the 90% before the close. Because if you're screwing up the close, chances are there's something going wrong in the 90%, okay? So the six sales points that I teach, this is Jim, this is Tina, whatever. Number one is keep Tina or Jim on the phone. That's the first sale. It's keep Tina or Jim on the phone. Right? Or to get them to believe that you're the expert. You gotta, take, you gotta get rapport and you gotta take control of the conversation. Jordan Belfort teaches that you got four seconds to do that. You gotta be enthusiastic, sharp as attack, bold. Right? That's the first sales point. Second sales point is away from motivation. Okay, away from motivation is kinda like this. You're obviously familiar with Tony Robbins. Yep. Right? So back in the day, Tony Robbins, when he first started, used to help people break addiction, particularly smoking addiction. And how he would do it is he'd take the client, take him to a, a liquor store, have him buy a carton of smokes, put a, a cigarette between each finger, light it all up, and smoke them all at the same time and work their way through the carton. And at the end of it, Tony would say, hey, Jim, would you like a cigarette? And the person would be like, no, 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 I, uh, I never want to smoke again. And consequently enough, they'd go on and never smoke again. Why is that? It's because they associate a massive amount of pain to the behavior of smoking. So whatever you're selling, you need to get them to smoke some cigarettes. And the way that you do that is you ask uncomfortable questions, right? They need to take a step outside themselves and realize that they're number one, 100% responsible for where they're at up until that point. Because a lot of people that are buying products and trying to solve a problem, they have an infrastructure that is based on a victim mentality, especially my client. My client has a victim mentality. She, she has an external locus of control. She thinks it's her husband that, She's got the reason why she got 100 pounds. She thinks it's, 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 it's the kids. She thinks it's time. It's none of those things. It's her, right? So we ask uncomfortable questions. And it's not to be an A piece. It's to get them to realize, wow, I've been treating myself poorly. I want to move away from it. Third thing is towards motivation, right? Towards motivation, moving towards the things that you desire. Now with my client, you know, someone that has 100, 150, 200 pounds to lose, right? Uh, the challenge is, is that they do not believe that they're worthy of achieving X because their track record proves otherwise. They failed here, 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 right? So I, knowing that, like before the call even happens, right, because that's just my, that's my client, that's the person we speak to every single day, I need to do whatever it takes to get Tina or Jim to see what they desire. And the, one of the powerful ways that I do that, I literally give them permission to do that. You know, hey, you're in the right place. You know, hey, you know what, right now I wanna know why is this really important to you? Right? And they'll say like, oh, you know, I want to feel good. Yeah, yeah, but here's the thing. We all want to feel good, right, Tina? Yeah, absolutely. So the days that you're, you don't want to lace on your Nikes and you don't want to do this, what are you going to fight for, right? So give them the opportunity to think about that. Get their why out. Four sales points being a doctor, right? Being a doctor. You think about going to the doctors, right? You yeah, have a, you have a, a solution. Yeah, you get an infection, right? The doctor's not like, hey, hey, Nick, uh, you got an infection on your back. Can you kind of sort of maybe possibly take these two pills twice a day for the next 30 days? He's like, no, hey man, you got this problem. I need to take these two pills twice a day for the next 30 days. Cool. Okay, great. Got, got any questions? Okay, cool. See the nurse on the way out. Being assumptive, right? Owning, owning what you're selling. Owning what you're selling. Owning the script. Saying it with power, saying it with enthusiasm. Not the, uh, like owning it, owning it, owning it. Energy, right? Five is nurture. So in my industry with females, 97% of women will gain everything back within two years, plus some. The average female invests five times per year and she fails, right? So I know for a fact that she's gone on phone calls, invested in herself and failed, she's been scammed, she's been lied to. So I need to position myself in a place of nurture, right? And there's ways of doing that, but the focus, the focal point is immersing yourself 110% on that person that they get what they need because you gotta, number one, you gotta believe in your product. If you don't believe in your product, go find a new product to sell. And if you believe in your product, put all your focus and energy. I need to make dang sure that she gets off the phone with what she needs so she can go get help, so that she can save herself and she can save her family. And then obviously number six is the close.
And the reason why um, I teach those six sales points, and this is where a lot of sales leaders fail, is that if you think about it, that they're, they're individual muscle groups. So what I've been able to do, and this is kind of training the trainer, is train my leaders to identify which of those muscle groups is weak. Because what you'll, you'll identify if you have a lot of salespeople, which I do, is that every person has different muscle groups that are weak, right? There's people that are weak in sales point number one. If they didn't nail sales point number one, they're gonna have a difficult time cracking number two and three because they didn't earn full trust. So she's not gonna lower her walls down on the way, so you're not gonna get the juicy details. Or some people in number two, they get surface layer answers, they don't call them out, right? Like they say, um, uh, uh, someone says, hey, the reason why I have 100 pounds loose is because I don't have enough time. They're like, oh, okay, right? So when you get to the close, right, and you're asking for their money, and you're gonna, you're gonna, they're gonna walk all over you. Why is that? Because you set up the conditions for that to take place, right? Not enough pain. Not enough pain, right? And along the way, on the six sales points, we talk about whack-a-moles. You ever see in the arcade thing? Yeah, yeah. So we call them whack-a-moles, right? Sales is a lot like dating, right? Uh, one of my favorite books is 3% Man by Corey Wayne. I don't agree with everything that he says, but I, I agree with his psychology, right? He says that women test. Women test. They test. And the reason why they test is they want to they test the strength of the man to see if he's really what he's made of. And if they don't handle the test, then the attraction level is going to go down. And they're going to question whether this man has a strong core or not. So with my client, and this is the same for any sale, this is with Jim Ortina, they're gonna test. And they do in the form of a whack-a-mole, right? So a great example would be, like if we were saying, hey, hey Nick, you know, so your goal here is 100 pounds fat loss, right? Yep. Got it, okay, cool. So Nick, what bad habits got you to 250 pounds? You know, a lot of, a lot of men, it's emotional stress eating, procrastination, what's your thing? So it, for me, it was like, I just didn't know what to do. And then, so I just went to like the easy thing. Like I have pizza bites and I just don't really know what workouts to do. And so that's- just Tell me something like time. I don't have time. Okay. I don't have any time. I, I don't have any time to work out. I have no clue. I don't have any time to eat. I don't know how to cook. Cool. Hey, hey Nick, can I, can I be real with you instead of nice with you? Yeah. Awesome, man. So the difference between the 250 pound version of you and the 150 pound version of you is that the 150 pound version of you uses their 24 hours differently. It rarely makes excuses to get the job done. And what I'm hearing is, is that you're not making the time you're being lazy. Is that fair? Yeah. And I'm not saying that to make you feel bad. It's just that in order for us to solve the problems that we want to solve, we have to first take 100% responsibility for our actions. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. So what I did there was, that's a whack-a-mole, right? Imagine if I didn't handle that whack-a-mole and I let you spew out your excuses. Well, oh, okay. I would, be, I would be like more in charge of you. Like exactly. I'd be above you, I feel yeah. like. So the six sales points, each sales point has different whack-a-moles. They come in different shapes and sizes, but they're always the same. So for you guys that have a sales team, you need to have an infrastructure with your script, right? And I, I highly suggest, it may not be six, it might be five, it might be seven, but you need to have bullet points within your script. That's number one. You have to identify what they are, what the purpose of that, that, that sales point is, and how do you achieve that sales point. And then the next thing that you have to identify is what are the whack-a-moles that are prone to show up in that. So like for instance, like sales point number one, one of the common uh, whack-a-moles is I'm busy, I can't talk right now. Yep. Yeah, hey Jim, I hear you, but I'm actually, uh, I'm actually Mark's, res uh, Use Tina. Hey, 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 Tina, I hear you, but I'm actually Kalen's results liaison. I always speak to like 300 women on a day by day basis. Thousands of women beg for this phone call right now. You're one of those lucky people. Hey, I just need 10 minutes of your time. Why don't you step out? Because if you take this call, you're going to get off with clarity, drive direction that you've never had in your life. Cool. Yep. Awesome. That's whack a mole, right? That's like second, the second whack a mole is like that, right? The time. It's, it's, it's people not taking responsibility for the problem. So it would be the third one. I'd be like, well, dude, I just want to like, I just want to feel better about myself. Yeah, you know, we all want to feel good though, Nick. We all want to feel good. And I'm sure up until this point, you've wanted to feel good in your life before, right? Yeah. Has that gotten you into lace your Nikes on to go to the gym? No. What's going to light a fire under your ass? I don't know. <laughs> I think you do. Why don't you give yourself permission right now to figure it out? So that's boom, whack. Whack a mole. I love it. Yeah. And then if you do happens, those correctly, like the sale is easy. The sales point number six is easy. Because I've set up an environment where number one, this person cannot walk all over me. This person is not the expert of their future in this problem. I am, right? This person can't lie to me. 
So they're not going to give me some BS excuse at the end of it. And really what happens, it puts you in a strong position because let's say that they can't afford it, right? If you've addressed the whack-a-moles, you've earned rapport, you position yourself as an expert, you didn't let them sit in their, their victim mentality, you didn't let them get away with their excuses, you, you called them out for, for uh, uh, not being vivid enough with the, the, the future and the why that they want to achieve, um, all those things, right? And at the end, they're going to try to figure it out with you. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll work with you. You know, it's kind of like being at a coffee shop and instead of them like running away, it's like they're sitting next to you and you're sitting next to them and you guys are trying to figure it out together. So what I've seen with most of the guys out there is another, a lot of them aren't actually getting into a sales conversation. They don't have a structure. They don't know what to do. And, and there's usually two things. Sometimes the product just isn't that good. So like you said, they're not selling good products. They don't feel convicted and people just can't see it either. You yeah. know, like people can see that your guys' product is good. Uh, that people can see that, that that craft beer place, the pizza place, like they've tasted it, they've seen it, they know it's good, it's better than other places. And then the second thing though is that they're just not stepping up to the plate. Right. They're not focusing on the right things. They're getting up in the day, they start to focusing on all these things that don't matter, and they never actually go out there and sell. Yeah. sell. And then they say that almost every single billionaire, that over 50% of billionaires started off selling. Yes. That's what they started yep. doing. So what would you do or, or tell the people right now that are right now just aren't, they're good at sales, but they just don't feel like they have a good product, they're not consistent, and the second person that is just a phenomenal guy, but is just sucking at sales, and that's keeping him from growing his company, impacting mm -hmm. people, everything. Yeah, well number one, if you're selling a product that you don't believe in, get the hell out of Dodge City, period. You, you have to sell what you're passionate about. You have to believe in it, you have to be willing to fight for it. You know, I love, I love working at Lady Boss. I love it because, and I love selling it because I know for a fact that if she gives me her money, that on the other side, there's a lot of happiness, there's a longer life, there's better health, there's better self-esteem waiting for her. And, and for me, there's literally, I can't, when she gives me these excuses and all these things, it literally doesn't sink in my brain because I, I know that to be a fact. So I'm willing to fight for it. Because she'll either buy or she'll hang up, right? Now, for those of you that are good people but you're sucking at sales, one of the things I tell my people is how you, how you, how you show up for yourself and how you live outside these walls is how you're going to show up and, uh, or outside, outside uh, the office walls is how you're going to show up and perform inside these walls, period. Period. 100%. All the successful people on my sales team, they take really, really, really good care of themselves. They got a morning routine, they're doing affirmations in the morning, they're meditating, they're writing three things that they're grateful for, they're writing truth statements, they're talking about the ways that God's working in their life, they're texting their uh, leader that they finished their morning routine, they're on a roadmap that tells them exactly what they need to do, they're role playing their script once or twice a day, they're listening to their phone calls, they're uh, putting up their phone calls compared to other phone calls, they're reading 10 pages a day. Do you have any people that are selling that actually do the things, check in with their, their leader, do the daily habits that you guys put in place for them that don't succeed? And they, they, they consistently do them over and over and over again. Because what I found is that the majority of the people that fail just don't do the process long enough. Of course, there's going to be people that do it for a week and they check in with their leader or a month or something, but there might be a learning curve. How much different is the success rate just with the people that actually put in the work? Yeah, I, you know, I've, I've seen people come in that have put blood, sweat, and tears in, into the process and, and they absolutely grew and they had better results. Um, but they had a very, very finite lid. They just didn't have a lot of talent. Yeah. And what's crazy is that Alex Ramosi, we just did an interview together and he said, most people are just mediocre. They're just not that good. Yeah. And they need to put in that work. Yep. But do you, I mean, out of everyone out there, I've seen people like my, one of my best man, he, his personality type isn't good for sales. It's good for like coaching and being with people and not asking for anything. Yeah. Yeah. He's gone out there and been the number one salesperson for gym launch. You gotta want. You gotta want it, man. Yeah. You gotta. You gotta want it. Okay. You know, I told my team the other day. I was like, guys, if, if you're not working on your sales craft seven days a week, you, get, you gotta get a new job. This is a craft. It's 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 like working out. You gotta put in the sets. Gotta put in the reps. 100%. And for the people out there that just think they have no cap, like they have no ability to sell, I'm assuming they have other amazing abilities. Yeah. 
what would you say to them? Because I've always been someone that sold my own stuff as well. So yeah. I've never had to like be like, okay, I'm going to go craft this Taylor guitar. And I is don't, it, I'm too it, scared to talk so to So with this anyone. question, is it someone that has it like infrastructure? They have scripts, they have leads. They have not, they, they have a great product and great it's product. not getting out to the world. And they're like, I don't want to sell because I suck at it. And what Nick said about having no lid, like I have no lid. Every time I talk to people, I'm going to crap myself. Well, if you talk to yourself like that, then that's exactly what's going to happen. So you need to be your best damn cheerleader and take a stand for yourself. That's number one. Is there a way that they can partner with someone? Is there a different way to sell? Maybe they should try something else like video or written or try to find their place that they can sell. Well, you got to have a script, number one. Script. You have to have a script and you have to become unconsciously competent with How it. How many people do you think have a script? Not a lot. I, I, I see a lot of people out there that are trying to sell products and they're, they're trying to do the, uh, what's the word? They're trying to sell based off intuition. Yeah, good luck getting a million dollars per month doing that, buddy. For real, you have to have a script. Well, no one else can do it. One right. person can sell. Like if it, like right now, if you never have a script again, like you've ingrained a script inside of you and you know like the points. Yes. But 40 people don't. Right. Like you have 40 people doing it. And that's one thing network marketing taught us as well. Brandon and Kaylin and Lady Boss, like they, they were network marketing with us. And one thing we noticed is that they wouldn't allow you to do anything that anyone could do. Like they were like, okay, you're gonna go into the house, you're gonna press play on the blender is what they'd say, and then you press play on the DVD and that's all you do. Yeah. And you let the DVD and the blender do the talking and that's it. Just make sure you can follow the directions, scooping the product in, that was it. And anyone who went out there and actually tried to be like way better than everyone, actually just like wouldn't do that well because the team couldn't do it. Right. Only they could, which I think is very interesting. You've been able to master having not only yourself do it, I'm, you could sell all day without a script. Yes. I guarantee it. Yep. Because you've built it inside of you. Yes. But no one else could. Right. So like, how do you keep yourself disciplined to make sure that you actually consistently do that? Right. Because like for me, like, I don't do that. I'm like, oh, like write a script. In my mind, I'm like, oh, there's so many variables. What if this happens? What if this happens? Like, I don't want, I just want to have my key points and I just don't want to do it, but then no one else can do it. Because then it's just me that knows how to navigate. Well, it comes down to systems and processes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, my, like, you know, salespeople, especially when they're new on your team, it's kind of like having a newborn. You know, they, they say that when the, the child's born for the first two hour period, that when the, the mother and the, the, the daughter or the son or whatever, they connect, that there's this inherent connection that takes place. And if it didn't happen, that would actually, the wiring, would, it, would, it would alter the wiring in the child's brain. So I, I take the same approach with salespeople. Like the first thing that they see is like who we are, what we do, why we do it, how it all started, and what and the uh, the impact that they get to be a part of. Because I, I first need to sell them on the company. Second thing I need to do is I need to sell them on me. So I, I blast through my, my entire background, who I am, what are my achievements, everything, and at the end I say follow my lead. Cool? Cool. And then I walk them through the products, right? The product, the bullet points, everything, right? And then we walk through the, the infrastructure of the script, right? Everything I just explained, I, I, I drill it into their brain. Then we do situational training, right? Here's the things that you're gonna run into on the straight line. Here's, here's all the stuff that's gonna uh, come your way. Here's how you handle it. And you compose it all into a training center, you put it into a playbook, and that's an infrastructure. And that's where a lot of people are failing in sales, and that's why people can't scale past one or two salespeople. Right, and then you need to have the process behind that, right? That's the, the newborn, the first touch, all the infrastructure, the script, that's your tool, the subliminal part of the script, what you're gonna see on the script, how to handle those uh, whack-a-moles, right? And then you have to have a system that holds them accountable, right? And the, the third piece of that is my roadmap that I have. I have some called a six-figure roadmap. It's freaking awesome, it's like six months. And it gives them for six months what they need to hit and what they need to strive towards, right? Because you know a lot of times, with especially with the internet marketers now, they, they hire these hundred percent commission salespeople, and they're like, uh, "I'm going to get you book calls. Here's the script. Go." It's like, well, dude, that's a human being, right? And we all have the same same um, innate needs, right? Certainty, safety, security, right? So I approach my 100% commission salespeople like I would an op operations person or an accountant or an administrator. I give them a vision, I give them a path because they're gonna see it, they're gonna believe it and they're gonna have clarity on what do I need to do to achieve X. And you gotta think about the confidence that you're gonna feel inside yourself, the excitement you're gonna feel, you're gonna wanna gravitate towards that, right? So that's how I've been able to really 
um, get people to kind of move through this funnel and grow as quickly as possible and become successful as quickly as possible. And I, you know, last couple months we've had zero attrition. Wow. I know my former sales floor was, was hiring um, three salespeople a week, firing two. I've lost nobody. It's because I've, I've built this engine that people just go through and the salespeople become successful. They see all other people winning and then they go do it. Go ahead. So you were one of the people on a sales floor yeah. just a few years ago. Oh yeah. <laughs> and then you went out and you started selling your own stuff. Yes. And then now you've built this huge sales floor out here in San Diego with Lady Boss. Yep. Take us through the difference that you've had in your life, kind of like wrapping this whole episode up. I just kind of want to know for you, you were a guy who was like sleeping in his car, not taking care of himself the way he should have, like, you know, leaving one place. Like, take me through like back when you were on a sales floor and the, some of the struggles that you went through and like places that you float around to, because I don't even know the pieces that are put together. And then kind of how you've changed and who you've had to become to now lead a sales floor. Because yeah. this is very different. Like, I'm interested in what did you do as a person to be able to become that guy? It, it. Now it's conscious, before it was unconscious, but I slowly but surely started to real, realize that whatever I say is heard over a megaphone and whatever I do is seen under a microscope. So that's going from being an employee to being a leader, right? I think that was the biggest growth process for me. What I do, they'll do. And when you got 40 people on the floor, you start to see that. Yeah. I run every day, I got a lot of people running. I got a nice uh, Gucci backpack and Gucci people are buying Gucci. It's like that's that's the power of influence. And I think it was a constant evolution of reflecting on myself and what fat needs to be trimmed, right? I need to let this go, this needs to come in. Well, if this is not serving me any, any anymore, I need to let that, that go and replace it with this. That's not serving me anymore, I need to replace that and, and, and put this in. And I think that's like the, 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 the core process that I had to go through from sleeping in my car to running a team that's doing over half a million dollars per month. Yeah, it's huge, man. And obviously we got connected at, we met at a office. And then I think the second time that we got connected was when you came to a BDB meetup dinner. Yeah. Which was like ridiculous in traffic in San Diego. Like half the people didn't even show up yeah. because they were like, not, <laughs> like it was so tough to get there. It was super annoying. Yeah. You showed up, I remember you had like, rolled up pants with yeah. shoes on or something like this. And you know, we met there, then we went and met in a cafe. Yeah. And that was at Bird Rock Coffee Roasters, I remember that. Yeah. And you've came to our first live event and you just like have accelerated since then. Obviously you're gonna be at this live event performing, right. which is something that you've done as a hobby, but you've been crushing it with yeah. rap and music yeah. and I don't know what the words for everything yeah. be, but yeah. you've been crushing yeah. it. And, and you'll be able to hear some of this. I'm, I'm so excited to launch something where he's been working on a song for BDB for the podcast episodes. And for you, man, like what was that journey like? Like we got to meet each other, you came to BDB Live, some of the friendships that you've made, the relationships that you made, and obviously like getting connected with Brandon. It was a good friend of mine, you already had the skills, but it was like an easy connection to be able to partner you guys two together and make like flour and yeast and make some bread. Yeah. How's that been? It's been awesome, man. Brandon's, he's one of my best friends. Um, like, how's it been in regards to... Yeah, like that whole process, like walk people through it and why they should come to BDB Live as well. Why they should come to BDB. You know, uh, there's a lot of things in my life that I'm very blessed for and I'm very grateful for. And I, I owe this man um, a large portion of that. You know, if I had met Brandon, I wouldn't have been able to step into my, my power. You know, I knew when I was at... SPS that this was what I was going to do. You know, I saw the people that were there and I knew I could do it better. I knew it. I was like, this is what I'm going to do. I need to do this. And you know, you, you just making one simple introduction, man, just like, Hey, meet Brandon. And then one phone call, one, one, one hour meeting changed everything, you know? Um, yeah, it's been, it's been life changing and you know, and that's all it takes. That's the, that's the crazy thing. That's all it takes. You know, one of my favorite movies uh, is Bleed for This, and at the end of this, but with Manny Pack, and at the end of it, um, they asked Manny Pack, what was one lie that you were told? And he says, it isn't that easy. And she's like, what isn't that easy? He's like, no, that was the biggest lie that I was told, right? And he's like, it is that easy, because people are gonna tell you that you can't do it, and if you just do that one thing, then it's already done. And, and I, I'm, I'm a huge believer 
that a, a huge part of that is you got to know people. You have to you have to put yourself in proximity's power, right? You have to put yourself in a position to win. You have to surround yourself with people that are winning, and that's exactly what BDB is. Um, people ask me, "Where's your family?" And you know, my family's on the East Coast of Connecticut, but I say my family's here. Yeah, because I look at you know Kevin and Douglas and everybody that's in in the BDB group, I, I consider them family because those are the people that stuck up for me when I, I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror, you know, and 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 that is that is true strength. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you, man, and I'm pumped to have you performing this year on stage. It's gonna be freaking awesome. Yeah. It's gonna be so fun. This guy, I just come for that in itself. There's so many people actually that if I don't know if they're messed with me or what, but they saw the protein bar sponsors, they saw the kombucha and they were like, why didn't you say that? And they went and got a ticket. And then another guy <laughs> saw that we had the lunches and stuff like that. And he was like, why didn't you just say that? Yeah. And then they got their ticket. And at this point, I'm just like, come for the kombucha, come for the <laughs> come for the protein bars, come to see the performances. Yeah. And we have some pretty good people and great speakers there as well. But those are like the secondary things. So one, I appreciate you, man. I yeah, appreciate man. you having the space. And I know that we're gonna create some amazing things together. If you guys wanna ride on this train of winners, which is what we've created here at BDB with this guy, the people that he was talking about, they're all gonna be at BDB Live. If you wanna jump on a train that's already gonna win, it's kind of like if you sat on the bench of a Super Bowl team, you, if you want to be on the bench of a Super Bowl winning team, but still win a ring, that's kind of what BDB is like. If you're just in the proximity, you're gonna win as long as you keep showing up. Yeah. Because we demand excellence out of you, we demand, demand the very best out of you, and it's the only way that you're gonna get to the life that you wanna have. Nicholas, you just came out of the book, a man just gave you a copy right here. Yeah. You just signed mine. I personally bought the book. I didn't get it for free. I bought the book to get a signed copy. Because if you invest, you're not invested. Exactly. I 100% agree. I, I mean, I... I family asked me, hey, Nick, can you send me the book for free? It's like, no. It's like you need to pay for it. Well, ask this guy. This, if you don't pay, you won't pay attention. The very first live event, this guy told me he's going to buy a ticket, and I wouldn't give it to him for free, and he waited 24 hours, and I raised the ticket price by, I think, 100 or 200 bucks. And he goes, dude, hey, sorry about that. Here's that money. I was like, hey, dude, no, it's actually 700 bucks now. Remember oh, that? yeah, yeah. <laughs> I made him pay more because it was over the deadline. And I wanted him to know that I was going to keep the word, even if, though it was awkward. Yeah. I've done that a million times now. Yeah. And at first, it's like people think I'm an ass. Like I've had people That's say, we're true, done. Man. I'm never going to talk to you again. I've had guys tell me, we're done. Yeah. I'm not talking to you anymore. That's their loss, man. Someone said, oh, man, I joined your 30-day uh, challenge, and I didn't do it. Can I redo this one? I said, nah, man, but you can invest another 100 bucks. Yeah, that pain is like what I was – that's what you got out of the challenge. You bought yeah. that pain. No one's entitled to like, anything in turn. They told me, nah, dude, yeah. we're done. I'm not talking to you anymore. And I was like – Some will, some won't, some what next. Write that down. Yes, that was your quote that you always said. But yeah. what's in the book? Tell us well, about First, I want to I want to share with your, guy, your good people books that you guys need to read because we're talking about sales. Sweet. So you guys yeah. need to pick up uh, The Way of the Wolf by Jordan Belfort. You got to study his straight line persuasion course. Those are absolute two months. write these down. Straight line persuasion, Jordan Belfort, Way of the Wolf, Pitch Anything by Oren Clef. Talks about frame control, because if you don't have the, the more powerful frame in your sales conversation, you're gonna lose. Talks all about that. Psychology of Selling by Brian Tracy. There's two particular chapters in there. Um, one is why, people, I think it's chapter three and chapter five, why people buy and the types of buyers. You need to read that. You need to read Go For No. So those are gonna be like your, your infrastructural sales tactical books. And it's just far as like grit and work ethic go, if you haven't read Relentless by Tim S. Grover, uh, what's that Grant Cardone's book, Be Obsessed or Be Averaged, you know, going back to what we were talking about, one of my favorite parts in that book was where he talks about starving your doubt. So a lot of people, they do have self-esteem challenges being on the phone, you need to starve your doubt. You need to forcefully will yourself into a realm where you do believe in yourself and you do stick up for yourself. And that's another, another great uh, book and I recommend those. If you, guys read, if you guys read all those books at least three to five times, uh, your sales will, will double, if not triple or quadruple. Um, and you need to pick up my book. <laughs> yeah, guys, I wrote this book. Uh, it took me two and a half years. There's actually four of them. Um, there's uh, 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 four parts to the system, actualized, vitalized, systematized, and potentialized. And you know, I kind of asked myself before writing this book, what would I say to my 19-year-old self if I can go back and, and talk to him? And sure enough, I had 650 pages of, of things to say. And uh, But this is my best stuff, guys. I don't hold anything back. All the healing, my routines, my um, the rituals, my day-to-day -day habits, it's all in here. Um, if you guys want to you know, 
get a signed copy, go ahead, just shoot me an email, nicholas at ladyboss.com, N-I-K-O-L-A-S at ladyboss.com, make the subject line, sign me, and uh, it's gonna be $40. I take Visa or MasterCard or Amex, and we'll get you out a signed copy. Go, <laughs> man, well, I appreciate it again. We're gonna be coming out with a song here for you guys soon. Yeah. Uh, nicholas, freestyle us out. Are you want me to freestyle it out? <laughs> I'll just play Give it. me a beat. So don't give me a beat. I can't give you a beat, man. You need to play that thing. We're, we'll come back to you guys with a song, though, and it'll be professional, and you guys are going to love it. It's going to be stuck in your head forever. Peace. Cool. Peace, guys.